All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's so great to be here. Uh, it's fantastic to be back in Vegas, right? So uh, my name is Kelly Cole, as you've heard. I am the Senior Vice President for Government Affairs at CTIA. Um, and we have a fantastic panel here today to talk to you about everything wireless on Capitol Hill. And I think what's really exciting about this panel and what I'm personally very proud of is the fact that we have some truly remarkable women up on the stage here today. Um, and honestly, the wireless industry is filled with just smart, dynamic, amazing women. And this panel is a tribute to that. So thank you all for joining us here today. I am gonna do some quick introductions, but I will preface by saying all of us spend a whole lot of time up on Capitol Hill. Um, we call ourselves uh, you know, government affairs specialists, but really all that means is we're lobbyists. <laughs> so we spend our time up on Capitol Hill trying to convince uh, members of Congress and staff um, sort of what is the best for the wireless industry, and uh, these women do it in spades. So I will start with uh, Wendy Donahoe, who is the vice president at AT&T. Next to her is Courtney Reinhardt, um, Vice President at Verizon. And then we've got Laura McPherson, the Director of Federal Legislative Affairs at T-Mobile. And last but certainly not least is Lynn Starr, Vice President at Ericsson. So I'm gonna give us a round of applause. <laughs> so I'm gonna start with sort of a more sort of high level conversation about 5G. And obviously, as I mentioned, all of us spent a whole lot of time up on Capitol Hill talking to members of Congress, talking to congressional staff about sort of what is 5G? Um, is it here? Is it going to be here soon? What does it mean for consumers, for businesses, for our country? And I kind of want to get a little bit from each of you how those conversations are going on Capitol Hill and how do you feel like policymakers are, are, are they understanding 5G? Do they know what it means? Um, and do they understand what needs to be done to sort of realize 5G in this country? So I'm going to start with you, Wendy. Sure. First of all, yes. I think <laughs> <laughs> members of Congress and policymakers really do have a strong feel for 5G. And maybe not necessarily the realization of what 5G is yet, but given their experience from 4G, which really was the platform for the smartphone, which brought this revolutionary innovation to consumers across the world, um, which was the you know, era of become photo sharing and uh, social media and every app under the sun. I mean, you know, no one could envision all of the innovation that took place as a result of 4G. So I think it's natural that at this point they're thinking, what does 5G have in store for us? We definitely want to be part of that. We want the, um, you know, the U.S. to be competitive and stay up and can be able to, you know, bring this innovation to the U.S. and across the country. So I think it's interesting. A lot of members of Congress on the House side in particular, I think, tend to be younger, um, understand the Internet, understand what it means. I mean, Courtney, do you think... Do you, how much do you think members of Congress actually appreciate what it takes to get to 5G? And what, what we do every day, how are they receiving that? It's, it depends on the member. I think uh, there's a, a real um, uh, appreciation about how important 5G is, how it is going to be the platform that's, um, uh, you know, going to, uh, it's important for American leadership. They understand that very much. And... Uh, I don't know that they know what it takes in terms of getting all of the necessary components to build the network, all that we have to go through with standard setting, with obtaining the spectrum, although they, they tend to understand that a little bit, uh, actually quite a bit because they have to be involved. But um, uh, I think um, they definitely understand and appreciate how important it is, and they want to be helpful. So it's a very bipartisan um, support for 5G, which is encouraging. I mean, Laura, I feel like we've spent years talking <laughs> to members of Congress about 5G. I mean, do you think they're getting it? You know, I think so. Um, they talk a lot about bridging the digital divide. Mm -hmm. um, Democrats do, probably more so. Um, and obviously there's been so much talk through the pandemic of connectivity, um, so much funding on infrastructure, the recognition of um, the economic impact and the growth potential with 5G. 
um, jobs. So I do think they recognize all of that. Um, I think when it comes, when you look back, as Wendy was talking about 4G, that was sort of the sharing economy. I mean, you know, we had ride sharing and we had Airbnb sharing. And um, I'm kind of looking at 5G as productivity. It just seems like there's a lot of behind the scenes, so it's kind of hard to get your arms around. And so explaining test cases to members, I think they understand that better than, Mm -hmm. you know, they're starting to get it. But it's still kind of like a little bit amorphous. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's, you know, telling them that it's, it's here, Uh, but it's like two years in, and we've got a long way to go. Um, I know when we worked on the 6G commission, we're like, wait a minute, we're only on 5G. (laughs) We're just starting. So um, it it is an educational process. And obviously as a non-carrier working for Ericsson, I'm kind of curious if you're seeing this from a little bit different of a vantage point. Well, I'll agree with what everyone else has said, but I'll add that I think it is difficult to explain the technical components. Mm -hmm. That's something, you know, members of Congress work on so many different issues, and to get into the weeds on what actually is 5G, not many can go there. There are some, but not many. But I think they're understanding that, as you all have really said, that it will become the platform for new innovation, and they're starting to have a vision of what the use cases might look like. Um, Again, as as you said, I think too soon to really tell. But one thing they really understand is how important it is for U.S. leadership and that as we're competing with other countries around the world, that the U.S. leadership in 5G is really crucial. Well, and that's the perfect segue to our next sort of topic of conversation, which is spectrum. If you guys haven't gotten enough spectrum over the last (laughs) hour or so, but we're going to dig a little bit more into that from the congressional side. Spectrum, obviously, is just incredibly critical to 5G, and we're certainly living that every day. Um, I think a part of that conversation, which we're in the middle of right now, is auction authority and the FCC's extension of that auction authority. And I think good news is it looks like there's going to be an extension of the auction authority that will be in the continuing resolution that will pass, fingers crossed, this week. Um, that will likely take us to December 16th, but I would love to sort of talk a little bit about the importance of auction authority, because I know in some meetings that I've done, there's some staff who don't, frankly, understand the importance of auction authority. So um, actually, Courtney, I'll start with you. So what's, what do you think is the, the importance of that issue um, to sort of the larger conversation around wireless and 5G? Sure. Um, auction authority, the FCC cannot uh, conduct auctions without auction authority. And so it's extremely important for the FCC to have that authority. Um, we've never had a lapse in auction authority. And so that's, that's how important it is. And um, the auction authority enables the FCC to be ready for anything. And as we all know, uh, our industry is very dynamic and you just never know. Um, you know, we've got some AWS licenses that are being returned and are going to need to be auctioned. But the FCC has to be ready for anything. They have to be ready to auction and address whatever issues come down the pike um, in our dynamic industry. So it's really important uh, for that to continue. It's important for us to look um, like we're still committed to auctions as we head head into the uh, WRC, the World Radio Conference that NTIA's Scott Harris mentioned in his speech. Uh, we're preparing for that next year, and that's extremely important. And we've had some kerfluffles. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, we really need to not have any more. And so um, for all of those reasons, it's really important to continue. We, we know that we need to have a short-term extension of auction authority and then focus on a long-term pipeline plan, but we cannot just let it lapse. I was kind of heartened during the Senate Commerce Committee hearing um, that happened, I think it was the end of August, or the big, end of July, end of August, excuse me, um, where I think there was a general agreement among the senators on the dais that auction authority needed to be extended. Is that how you read the room? Yeah, that was a great hearing. Meredith did a great job. Um, it did highlight it. Um, I think senators were, you know, uh, maybe took their eye off the ball a little bit only because they had so many other pressing issues that they were working on. So um, we were in the industry getting a little nervous that they weren't even going to get to this. So we were happy that they had the hearing. And, you know, obviously when you have auctions that, um, there was an auction that ended and for the FCC to complete that 
uh, you know, they have a lot of work to do to clean up the auction and to process and hand out the licenses. So everyone pays a lot of money for that. I know T-Mobile, you know, was a big um, auction winner for 2.5, as well as a lot of other um, smaller carriers uh, won licenses in that. But in order to get those licenses, they have to have this auction authority. So again, you can't really, we've been in this position before with C-Band where um, things got held up. And so that's really not a good uh, path for moving forward and giving reassurance to an industry that they should bid on auctions and be involved if there's any kind of doubt out there about whether you're going to get your license and be able to put that spectrum to use. Um, you know, we want to deploy uh, the 2.5 that supercharges our network. It helps our in-home product, which is very competitive. Um, there's so many important things. So uh, that's, and, and not to mention the global the signal it sends globally with the WRC and other countries want to leapfrog us. I mean, we have been the leader and we want to stay the leader. So we have to extend that auction authority. Absolutely. And Wendy, I think when we have those conversations about auction authority, we're off, oftentimes having those conversations in the context of we need auction authority and let's couple that with a spectrum pipeline. And every, nearly every time Congress has extended auction authority, they've actually coupled that extension with some actual auctions. So uh, talk a little bit about the work that we're doing as an industry on Capitol Hill and making sure that pipeline sees the light of day. Right, so we've been um, very active with members of Congress to walk them through particular bands, particularly mid-band, um, in order to, um, to get to a pipeline bill. And the House and Senate have both been active. Um, the House passed the Spectrum Innovation Act, I think it was in July, and that focused on the 3.1 to 3.45 band. And then within that legislation, there was an extension for FCC auction authority. Um, that, there was also a companion bill in the Senate, but there's also been other discussions in the Senate about a more robust pipeline bill during this period of time. So um, now there's discussions about, you know, which, uh, you know, what's going to be progressing, what's moving forward, what's the time frame. You know, how do we position that and work with members of Congress to make sure that that actually happens? Um, within that, there is this, you know, ob obvious and ongoing tension between uh, uh, when we discuss spectrum between the licensed and the unlicensed community, right? So currently, the unlicensed community has roughly four times more spectrum than the licensed community. So, you know, we think there really needs to be more balance there, that the licensed community is really should be getting more spectrum. So our discussions are more about the advantages for licensed spectrum, um, for extending an actual pipeline of the four, um, lower three, four, and seven, um, and really putting into place a long-term plan for certainty, because that's what the carriers rely upon for their planning, so forth, and we want to make sure that we're able to build out 5G as quickly and efficiently as possible. So those three bands that you mentioned um, and have been discussed in other contexts, um, do we think, I mean, those are all obviously mid-bands. Um, what's been the reaction so far from members on the lower three, the four, and the seven and eight? I don't know, Courtney or Lori, you want to tackle that one? Um. <laughs> I'm going to hand that over to, uh, to you. Um, well, you know, there is some pushback on the lower three, I think, from the defense community and the SASC uh, committee. The Senate Sorry. Armed Services Committee, Sorry. for those yep. of you that don't run in the Capitol Hill circles. <laughs> um, so there's, there's some work to be done there. Um, they, there's a draft bill currently that does not include the Spectrum Innovation Act and uh, that, that band for that reason. So we're going to continue to work. Um, we're hopeful to have more discussions. I think that was discussed a little bit on the last panel um, that without... Um, unveiling, you know, state secrets, hopefully we can have conversations to figure out a way to utilize that band and to, you know, get it in the pipeline and to study it more. Um, the other ones seem to be on the table, so mm -hmm. we're hopeful. Well, and honestly, I mean, that Spectrum Innovation Act passed pretty handily in the House, didn't it, Courtney? I mean, well, it was a bipartisan bill. It sailed through the House. Um, any thoughts there? A lot of bipartisan support um, mm -hmm. for that band, but I think it's a, one thing that we have learned and one thing we have to continue working on is that 
you have to have um, um, a motivated incumbent um, in order for this to work. If, if you have a, an incumbent in the band that is not, uh, you know, not uh, convinced that there's a better option or that um, this is going to work, then it's probably, it's going to take a whole lot longer um, and they will, you know, it will be a, another curve level. So <laughs> I like that word too. Our new favorite word. Our new favorite word. <laughs> so I think um, we have a lot of work to do. We need to make sure that, and that's why we need, um, why it's so encouraging that Congress is starting to have these discussions, understands the importance, but we need to make sure that everyone involved is communicating, that everyone has buy-in, and then we have to, we have to put those, um, those decisions and have the force of law behind them in order to make sure that um, the planning uh, can take place and all the things that we need to do to get ready to um, utilize those bands and to move incumbents to, um, to better systems and um, all the things that we need to do. So uh, we, it's, it's going to be a, uh, we're gonna have a lot of work ahead of us. We certainly are. Another Lynn. thing that I think helped makes this promising is that members of Congress do understand that spectrum auction proceeds help can help fund a number of congressional priorities. Great point. In the Spectrum Innovation Act, for example, you see in the House bill there's funding for rip and replace, and maybe we'll talk a little more about that, and for NG911. Um, FirstNet was originally funded by Spectrum Auction Proceeds. So I think there is an understanding of that, and hopefully that helps encourage both the uh, ex auction extension and additional Spectrum being made available. Well, you're excellent at reading my mind because you're taking me right into the next <laughs> question, so well done. But um, obviously all of the Spectrum in the world doesn't really make a difference if you don't have the network equipment to deploy networks. So, um, Lynn, obviously, in your position at Ericsson, you're spending a lot of time on Capitol Hill talking about the larger debate around trusted vendors and, you know, Chinese equipment that may exist in some of our networks right now and that whole rip and replace conversation. So, I know uh, Congress has funded some uh, rip and replace efforts, but it sounds like there's still more to do. Um, so can you kind of give us a, a rundown on where we are on that issue and how it does, as you mentioned, tie into spectrum auctions? Yes, yeah, it definitely does. Um, sure. So I think to understand sort of the big picture, we have to take a little walk down memory lane to <laughs> 2020 in the before times when Congress passed and the president signed the Secure and Trusted Networks Communications Act. And that law determined that certain untrusted equipment was a threat to our national security, primarily Chinese equipment in our network. And they not only determined it was a threat to our national security, but that from small carrier networks, it had to be removed and replaced by equipment from a trusted vendor like Ericsson and, and others. We've worked really closely with these small carriers, signed contracts with many of them to help with this process. As the FCC started accepting applications, $1.9 billion had been appropriated by Congress for this job. The FCC quickly found out that the actual cost would be about $5 billion to rip and replace the equipment. So there's a $3.08 billion shortfall on this funding. And without this funding, these small carriers with Chinese equipment can't service their networks, they can't upgrade their networks, they're at risk of having to go out of business, their rural customers are at risk of not having connectivity. And so we're spending an awful lot of time helping support these small carriers. And it's not just small carriers, by the way. All of the large carriers roam on these small carrier networks as well. And if you're driving through a rural area, for example, you could be at risk of not having any connectivity. Um, so we're spending a lot of time trying to find any possible legislative vehicle to get this increased funding for these carriers. We had hoped maybe it would be in this continuing resolution that will pass this week, but apparently not. So there's year-end funding, the Spectrum Innovation Act that we talked about, but it's really a critical situation here in the US. We're go our government's going all over the world saying you shouldn't have Chinese networks, Chinese equipment in your networks, and yet here in our country, we do. So we're spending a lot of time trying to uh, get that message across on Capitol Hill and get that funding in place. 
Fingers crossed, end of the year. Fingers crossed. Um, I'm going to pivot to another pretty important topic that I know all of us spend a lot of time on, and that's the issue of privacy. Um, obviously, there's a huge desire for a national framework, a national standard for privacy. Right now, we've got sort of a bunch of different states going their own directions, which kind of creates a logistical nightmare for nationwide companies like yourselves. So um, we do know that a bill called the American Data Privacy Protection Act did pass through the House this year, or excuse me, passed through the House Energy and Commerce Committee. It not, has not made it to the House floor yet. Um, but there's obviously just been a ton of work happening on the privacy front. So I'm curious, I'll sort of throw this to all of you, um, sort of what's your view of the status of privacy legislation in the, in the Congress right now? And what do you think the prospects are going forward this year, sort of going into next year? I mean, we're obviously running out of legislative days, but when do you want to go sure. first? Right. So um, I think it's kind of uncertain right now what's going to happen with the current privacy legislation that's sort of percolating um, on, on, the, on the House side. Um, at AT&T, we support a national framework for privacy, and we believe there should be one regulator. Currently, there are a number of states that there's state privacy legislation popping up here, there, and everywhere, and that's really not conducive to, you know, your business setting these, you know, these requirements, these regulations, or requirements for privacy as we make our way through our products. So um, we would prefer to have a national framework, and we're, we're hopeful that at some point we'll be able to all work together and, you know, come to some consensus on some legislation. So, so I, don't, I don't know, answering your question, I don't know if that would be this year or if it's going to, um, you know, fold in, go into next year. Um, it's looking uncertain at the moment. I mean, there's some big issues that are still sort of percolating around the issue of privacy. Um, state preemption issues, private right of action issues, certainly the influence of California, which has passed its own law, and sort of how that um, fits into a national debate. Um, Courtney, any thoughts on some of those big ticket issues? Yeah, those are the big issues. Yeah. Um, Not inconsequential of, either. <laughs> Not inconsequential. <laughs> um, but it's encouraging because you see the four corners of the Commerce Committees in the House and Senate. Um, there may be some differences on um, around the edges, but I think there's agreement that there needs to be a national framework. There needs to be preemption and, uh, and have the FTC um, in charge and deputizing the states for enforcement. And so... And you're seeing a lot of, and I mean, the American um, Data Privacy Protection Act um, came out of the House Energy and Commerce Committee with an overwhelming bipartisan vote uh, uh, this summer. I think it was 63 to 2. Don't quote me on that. So um, the, this is um, tremendous progress. It's historic progress. We, uh, we've been, at Verizon, we want to agree with everything that Wendy said. We've been in favor and advocating for a federal a privacy framework for a, at least a decade. And so it's it's really encouraging to see so much progress being made. And again, it is uncertain. You know, we haven't given up hope. We want to encourage um, continued uh, progress. Um, but we do believe that going next year, this will be one of the things that uh, Congress will pick up pretty early and try to, uh, to move forward, uh, I think, early on in the 118th Congress. So we're encouraged by that. You think this is a next year project, Laura? Probably. I think probably. Um, we're getting a little late into the session, so yeah. um, you know they're going to wrap up here soon. Go home for elections. There are some elections happening. Um, <laughs> come back for you know a, a big omnibus, most likely. Um, we don't know what's going to happen with the election, so that leaves a lot of uncertainty. And you know people like to kind of wait and see who's in charge, so that might hold it over till the following year. Um, I, the question, I guess, is do they start all over or do they kind of like, we have made a lot of progress. So hopefully, you know, there's still these, these issues. California's one. Um, I think just keeping up with the laws. I mean, I was talking to a Democrat office uh, last week or the week before, and they brought up the Dobbs decision mm -hmm. and how, you know, they're concerned about states that um, enact legislation around that and then want to track uh, you know, really invade uh, privacy on healthcare. So there are issues that come up that make it difficult. So that's probably one that's going to be difficult going forward. Um, totally. Agree. Not to mention, I've heard, also heard talk of California of figuring out some bifurcated floor 
for a federal standard so that you could um, have something a little bit higher. I don't know how that's going to work, but there's a lot of ideas out there on these, you know, just some of the items that are holding up uh, a final bill. Have you spent much time on this, Lynn? I've spent some, and I agree with everything that's been said. I think there is wide recognition that a patchwork of different state privacy laws is completely unworkable. Um, Ericsson's a global company, so we have to comply with different privacy laws around the, and data security laws all around the world. And it's, it's challenging when things don't match up. And I, I think there is now that recognition, and it is encouraging, as Courtney said, that, that the group is talking and working together, and um, hopefully they're going to get there. Well, let's pivot again to uh, broadband deployment. Obviously, last year we saw a massive infrastructure bill pass the House and the Senate, pretty historic in the levels of funding that we saw come out of that bill, um, upwards of $60 billion going to broadband, which is just really remarkable. But obviously, I mean, Lynn, this is Big for Ericsson, and I think, you know, a well, lot of the... Big well, for, for all of you, but, right? For everybody. Now, if we're deploying yeah. networks around the country, right. that means a whole lot of equipment that's going to be needed to deploy those networks. It's so, really exciting. What does it mean for Ericsson? It, it is, absolutely. Well, we're working hard to support our customers um, to help them take advantage of these opportunities. I will say, I think all of us worked very hard as this law was passing to be sure that wireless would qualify for this funding because there was a point in time when it looked like it was going to be very fiber-centric. And we need to have fiber, too. There, there should be a mix. But ultimately, the law that passed is technology neutral and sets speed requirements that fixed wireless access can meet right now. So that's really exciting. And um, we're watching very closely as NTIA implements this law now it, because it's unclear how technology neutral they're actually going to be in that implementation. They've set a preference for fiber um, as, as part of their rules, but we're, we are watching that closely and are hopeful that um, there's a role, not just for fixed wireless access, but for mobile also. I, I'm sorry to take the floor here on this, but I just saw a study that showed that 80% of people if they forget their phone at home, would turn around and go back to get it. Me. Yes. I don't know. I don't know who the twenty percent are, but in these rural areas, mobility is really important too. Like you can have fiber to the farmhouse, but you don't. If you don't have mob mobile wireless out on the farm, it really is not that effective. If you're driving on a rural road and you don't have mobile access, um, fiber to a home is is not going to help you out there. So there's a huge opportunity here, I think, for the wireless industry, and we're pretty focused on it. Well, and we heard a lot this morning at the keynotes about fixed wireless, and I know many of your companies are, you know, actively involved in rolling that out across the country. Um, and, you know, it's been a big issue for the Biden administration, this whole notion of competition and the role that competition can play in keeping prices down and low. And um, I'd love for, you know, the three of you carriers to talk a little bit about fixed wireless, um, do, you, do you think members of Congress and the Hill sort of appreciate that that's sort of the next frontier and could be a real competitive option to cable? Laura? I think they're starting to get it, but it's still an education process. I'm surprised every day of people who've <laughs> never heard that we have this great product, you know? We touted it a lot during our merger with Sprint that the spectrum combination was gonna create what we've heard today all day. Uh, very fast speeds and low latency, which was going to allow us to have provide this great, we call internet freedom, um, because we have no contracts. Uh, you, there's no installation. You don't have to wait for someone to come to your house. You plug it in. Um, just so many great features. Um, $50 a month. You don't pay for a router. On and on. And this is what Congress is always talking about, mm -hmm. competition. So I am surprised and that more of them don't know about it, number one, and number two, uh, uh, we do our best in letting them know, but number two, just into kind of taking credit, like, wow, um, this is, who would have thought of this even a year and a half ago? Mm -hmm. So it is great progress, and I think it's just a testament to this industry. Um, we say what we're going to do, and then we do it, and uh, technology moves really fast, so it's very exciting. Yeah. Courtney? Yeah, I um, completely agree. Um, we even had a um, Super Bowl 
um, commercial about it featuring Jim Carrey. So um, we're very excited about Fix Mobile. And to your point about competition, um, Verizon has its um, wire line network in the eastern seaboard. Um, and that's, you know, the Fios network at home broadband, broad, you know, uh, fiber to the home broadband. But what Fixed Wireless does is enable us to go outside of our wireline footprint and, uh, and bring competition um, in the um, home broadband market uh, all over the country. It enables us to utilize our wireless network and bring um, at home competition or, you know, home broadband competition to areas where it maybe not, hasn't been before, or we can increase it. So it's, a, it's very exciting. And, um, and I agree. I think members are going to start understanding how beneficial that is to the marketplace soon. We're trying to raise awareness, but, um, uh, but there was uh, more to be done there. It's a constant education battle on that. Yes. <laughs> We're so important. We need yeah. to... And then certainly building broadband out, especially to more rural areas, is a huge undertaking, mm -hmm. right? So there, you know, that's the great thing about all the carriers up here. We all go about it slightly differently, but we all have the same goal in mind is to make sure that broadband gets to everyone everywhere. So um, certainly, you know, very rural areas, a fixed wireless product is terrific. AT&T is also pushing out their fiber. So we're going hit, to be hitting roughly 30 million locations by 2025. That's in our plan. So we're moving forward on that. Um, Congress has been so focused on making sure broadband gets to everyone. So, um, you know, I think that's just something that's going to be an ongoing effort by all the carriers. And I know that we um, have really taken to heart the local state communities we worked with to make sure we get their input because one size doesn't fit all for everybody. So we've worked really closely with them and are continuing to do that to make sure that, you know, broadband suits their communities and are, you know, meeting their needs. You know, something that's come up in a number of hearings that I've seen on Capitol Hill is, you know, when you put that much money towards broadband deployment, you also have to have a conversation about siting and permitting. I mean, you are pushing so much money out. And the goal is to get, to your point, you know, 100% of America connected to broadband. Um, and a huge part of that is going to be siting and permitting. So, Courtney, if you want to talk a little bit about, um, I mean, I feel like it was a big conversation a couple of years ago on the Hill, but that's probably something we're going to have to revisit as we are looking at spending upwards of $60 billion on broadband deployment. Yeah, like you said, you, can, you need spectrum, you need money, but you, you can have those two things and, uh, and then still uh, be held back by uh, the siting issue. If you don't get your permits or rights of way, can't build out. And so, yeah, I think um, next Congress, I think there's going to be, they've focused on spectrum, and they're going to continue to focus on Spectrum. They've, they've really put up the money to really uh, solve the digital divide. And I think next Congress, you're going to see a real focus on clearing out the regulatory underbrush, looking at all the things that can be done to um, encourage a faster um, and more efficient, streamlined uh, uh, siting, permitting, and, uh, and, and the uh, various... Uh, hoops that you have to jump through in order to uh, deploy. So that's extremely important, and we're very much looking forward to getting legislation passed along those lines. I mean, we've seen that conversation happen the last few weeks with Senator Manchin, right? He's been trying to get a, a permitting more energy-focused than broadband-focused, but some language put on the continuing resolution, and that was unsuccessful. I think there were other political factors at play in that, certainly. But um, it raises the issue about permitting among Democrats. I'm curious what you think um, the reaction is going to be going into next year on the broadband side. Uh, you know, I think the Democrats have been very involved in the discussion. Um, I think the kind of hesitancy is states want a say. Mm -hmm. So we have to really, I think, as an industry, really work with those state groups, uh, associations, and get their buy-in and having them at the table, I think that's the only way we're going to get Democrats on board. More for next year. <laughs> okay. I have to ask a political question is because the elections are right around the corner. And um, we obviously have a fantastic panel of political experts up here. Um, should we see a change in control in the House or the Senate or possibly both? What do you think that means for the wireless industry? And what 
What stays the same? What changes? I'm curious what you all see sort of ahead of you down the road. Lynn, we'll start with you. Well, fortunately, as I think we've all discussed, telecommunications generally tends to be bipartisan. So hopefully that will continue and we'll continue to see progress on the things that we've talked about. That said, I do think if, if the Republicans take control of either one of the chambers, we'll see a lot more oversight mm -hmm. of the infrastructure funding programs, for example, at NTIA. Um, we know that in the Senate Commerce Committee, there will be a change in Republican leadership as Senator Wicker goes on to chair the Armed Services Committee. It looks like Senator Cruz, uh, one of the two hometown senators from Texas where Erickson is, and, and AT&T as well, is likely to take either the chairmanship or the ranking Republican spot on the Senate Commerce Committee. That's going to be an interesting dynamic to see um, how he and Senator Cantwell, who's currently the chairwoman of that committee, will work together. But we'll work with uh, both sides of the aisle. We have excellent relationships, as we all do, on both sides of the aisle. And um, hopefully we'll be able to continue to push our innovation agenda forward. What do you think, Laura? I agree. I mean, our, our industry is something that everyone wants on the Energy and Commerce Committee or the Commerce Committee because mm -hmm. they're exciting issues, you know. We're, we're fine. There. We're fine. We're fine. <laughs> um, so I think they'll continue to work together. I do think if either body flips uh, Republican, there is going to be a lot of oversight of various programs, look back on all of the pandemic funding and so forth. Um, but there will be some new issues on the horizon. I think USF is one that's going to, you know, starting to bubble up as a lot of funding is coming out of that and we need to figure out a way to, to make that sustainable. So that's a kind of spot, spot checking in the future, something that we'll be looking toward. And then looking back, um, also mapping. I mean, we spent two or three years working on mapping legislation and now the FCC is coming to the end of that process, hopefully, or I don't know if this is like a, a, a <laughs> first initial step and then another step, I'm not really sure, but I know a lot of members on both sides of the aisle are very concerned about mapping, particularly with the amount of money that's going to be going out for all of, the, all of this broadband investment. We have to get the maps right, and that money really needs to go to places that are unserved or uh, underserved. So I think those are kind of two issues that folks uh, will be looking toward, and there will probably be a lot of bipartisan, continued bipartisan support, as well as the pipeline and spectrum stuff assuming that we don't get that comprehensive bill done this year, which we might, um, there's a lot to look forward to in a bipartisan way. So Lynn raises an interesting point with Senator Cruz taking over either as chair or ranker of the Senate Commerce Committee. Senator Cruz has been a pretty outspoken advocate for repurposing government spectrum for commercial purposes. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, he's been... Um, you know, he's, he's really spoken out in a couple of uh, hearings. And uh, so I think that'll be good for the wireless industry. And like Lynn said, um, it is, you know, it does tend to be bipartisan. And I think no matter who wins the House, the Senate, uh, President Biden is still going to be president. So anything that passes is going to have to be uh, bipartisan and have a lot of buy-in. And so I, I do think everyone's going to have, on, on Capitol Hill has to keep that in mind. So, I, I, you know, I don't know that things are going to be um, radically different. Yeah. Um, there might be some, you know, a little bit of different focus, like on uh, citing legislation, streamlining. Um, but again, it'll have to be bipartisan. It's not going to be any radical. Yeah. Shifts. I mean, you're still going to need 60 votes in the Senate. Right? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's the key there. Bipartisanship gonna... brains. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm, I, I don't really have much to add beyond what my colleagues up here have said. I think that's very much in line with where I, we see things going. Um, I was encouraged by what Scott Blake Harris had to say about Spectrum. We mm -hmm. absolutely know we're, we're need, we need to get Spectrum. And he seemed very committed to working with the other agencies and everybody working together. Um, in order to facilitate that. And then that would hopefully translate into conversations with Capitol Hill, both Republicans and Democrats, to make sure that happens. So, yes, I see that all taking place. Fantastic. All right, well, we're going to end with a lightning round. You guys ready? <laughs> Go. Oh, no. All right, number one, quick answers. 
What legislative issues do you think the industry will be focused on next, next Congress? Wendy. <laughs> well, I mean, I think Spectrum will be an ongoing issue for us. Yep. So beyond Spectrum, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think Spectrum, as I said, I just think it's going to be an ongoing. It's number one, number be. two, and number three. Exactly. Yeah, that's so good. important to us, mid-band and, you know, our continuing work uh, to try to acquire more. Um, Courtney. I agree with that. I think um, a sleeper issue that people are going to start hearing about a lot more is funding for the um, American Connectivity Program, ACP. Mm -hmm. And then, like Laura said, combined with that, you know, we're going to have to probably see some uh, USF reform. And that's really, um, you know, bubbling up to the surface and becoming an acute issue. And so I think Congress is going to have to address it. Laura. Privacy, which we've already talked about. That's yeah. going to be huge front and center. Um, Lynn mentioned, you know, a lot of these companies are working globally and we are woefully behind our other countries um, on the privacy front. So yeah. I think consumers also are demanding more privacy. I agree. Lynn. I, I agree with all of yes, you. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but I'll add, I think we're going to see more focus on 6G in the next conference. Oh. I think there's going to be a lot of interest. Um, we're seeing it already, right? Um, I know. We need a pipeline to, if you can have Can we just you get 6G? 5G so, done? Uh, <laughs> coming soon to a theater near us. <laughs> All right. Next question. Will we see changes in the control of House or the Senate or both? Wendy. Mm. Well, it's hard to really, when you live inside the Beltway like we do, <laughs> we talk to each other. We're our own little echo chambers here. Um, but if you, you know, it appears as though there might be a change. It looks like the Republicans may have an edge. Um, Lightning round. For the House. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Moving <Courtney>. on. <laughs> Definitely the House. That's historically where we're, you know, we're in a midterm yep. and a new presidential um, administration. So the House definitely, and I, I don't know about the Senate. I think that's a toss-up. Laura? I'll just be the counter here. They're going to stay the same. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mix and the same. <laughs> Lynn. I'm going to play it safe and let the pollsters prognosticate <laughs> about the outcome, and we'll work with whoever is in, in control. Amen. Yeah, we are a bipartisan organization. <laughs> we are. All right. What 5G innovation are you most excited about? This will wrap it up for us. Um, I'm going to say smart home. I love mm. that idea. Okay. And flying cars. I like that. <laughs> Which both have made the news recently. So that's exactly what I'm very excited right. about. Courtney. I'm really intrigued and um, excited about the manufacturing aspect. We've got the robotics uh, getting better and better. And um, 5G is great for um, manufacturing. And there's a need to, I think the pandemic uh, really highlighted the need for uh, the United States to um, to do a lot more manufacturing in our own country. And it's just amazing what they're able to do. And so I'm excited about it. Laura. I'm excited about AI, which I know very little about, but I'm learning. <laughs> and we just announced a partnership with Palo AI, which is a company that is using very high-tech cameras in our network to go out in forests and uh, identify wildfires right when they start so that uh, first responders can get out there and put the fire out. So I think that's pretty exciting. Very cool. Lynn. I'm going to agree with Courtney on manufacturing. Um, if you were at the panel before, Barbara Baffer mentioned our 5G factory in Louisville, Texas, which is not just a factory making 5G radios, but also a 5G use case for manufacturing. And in fact, the, the factory opened in March 2020, which is not really the ideal time to open a factory. <laughs> um, and the plan was to bring workers from our factory in Estonia, which is very similar to the one in Louisville, over to train the workers in Louisville, but they couldn't travel. So they used augmented reality, and that's how we trained the workers in Louisville in the factory with the employees in Estonia. They're all wearing the goggles, and they're walking around the factory, and uh, it really went terrifically well. So it's time. That's Future amazing. is here. Yes. Well, I was obsessed with the U.S. Open this year because Serena retiring. Yeah. And apparently there is an AI system where you can actually play on Arthur Ashe Stadium. Oh, that's so cool. And I'm, so it's not nearly as, um, you know, lofty as <laughs> training people from Estonia to the United States. But I can't wait to play on Arthur Ashe Stadium. <laughs> so, well, thank you all so much. I can't, it was a fantastic panel. Appreciate your insights. And uh, we'll do it again next year. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.